too. Okay. Hi, <laughs> I'm Brendan. Oh, hi, Brendan. I'm Gary. <laughs> hi, Gary. Gary, we we know each other from Twitter, mm -hmm. and today's conversation was prompted by a tweet I did yesterday and a response you you made. Yeah. Yes, it was. And um, we're starting at around noon. And mm -hmm. I think I'm going to title this High Noon because the topic has to do with guns. <laughs> <laughs> um, I may just read this because my memory is not right. But I had written something saying, I think there's no honor in shooting or killing anything with a gun. And then I added, <clears throat> guns are addictive movie gun violence is dangerous to our health. Um, and you thought I was oversimplifying and I thought that would be a great basis for a conversation. I would agree. I think it's, uh, it's a wonderful topic uh, for a discussion. Um, I guess the first question that I would have is when you say that there's no honor in killing anything with a gun, uh, what I don't think there's honor in killing anything with anything. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> Here we are. In total Gary, I'm 75. How old are you? I am 60. Okay. And I live in Delaware um, okay. in the United States. I was born and raised initially in Brooklyn, moved to the island, then we moved to Virginia, New Hampshire, Colorado, and now in Delaware. How about you? What's your... Okay, uh, well, I am uh, currently living in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I was born and raised in Western Canada, so I was born in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, moved to Alberta with uh, my career in about oh, the mid-90s or so. Um, spent a couple of years or lived for a couple of years in uh, Toronto. And then uh, when I retired from the financial services industry, I decided to move back to, to Alberta to be closer to family and friends. So that's, that's my background. Where is Alberta in Canada? Uh, Alberta is on the west side of, uh, of the country. So the, uh, the province of British Columbia is the one that uh, borders up against the Pacific Ocean. Alberta is the, the next province over. Okay. So we're, um, Alberta is a very diverse province uh, on the far west side, uh, we're in the mountains. And then as you move further east, uh, you get uh, more into uh, to prairie lands and that sort of stuff. Saskatchewan, uh, the area that I was from in Saskatchewan, uh, I, was, I was born and raised in a very small town, uh, about 5,000 people. Kind of thing very rural area okay so i was raised in a very urban area <laughs> brooklyn new york did you own a gun when you were a kid or do you own a gun now uh i am a gun owner uh i had uh i grew up uh around guns my my dad had guns my grandfather had guns uh, my grandfather was um a hunter. My dad did a, a little bit of hunting, but it really wasn't, you know, his thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, there was always guns uh, around and available. I uh, used them, you know, from a very young age under supervision, of course. Uh, I was taught um, the respect and the safety for them, man. So you have a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and I've always, I've always enjoyed them. I've always respected them. I've always understood, um, you know, the the danger that they can represent. But you know, under proper usage, um, it's a recreational tool, like like anything else. Well, in Brooklyn, we weren't not we, but no one was allowed really to have pistols. Rifles weren't all that common either. Um, my grandfather had a <laughs> pearl-handled pistol, a revolver, which he kept locked up. And I remember as a little kid, getting to see that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. I also grew up after, war, right, I was born in 46. So I grew up right as World War II ended. And 
lots of movies and TV and everything else with war movies. So part of, I think my orientation was, um, I saw a gun as a very powerful tool, right? A way of solving problems. And in, in the United States, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but our morality plays were Westerns, right? Mm -hmm. And Westerns were always resolved with shootouts. Yes. Um, and, and guns were prominent there. When I was little, I guess my, my neighbor, my brother's friend, my brother was eight years older, his friend had a Red Rider BB rifle, a real one with a wooden stock and a leather, you know, a, a ring and a leather thong on that. And he gave me that. So I had that. And then before I was 13, I saved up enough and I got a 22. Highlight for me. Um, I own my, my BB rifle was stolen by my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a whole other story. Later, huh? <laughs> that sounds like a whole other story. Yeah. Um, Kathy and I, we own two semi automatic pistols mm -hmm. and a semi automatic 22 rifle. Okay. When we lived in New Hampshire, we owned a little bit, um, we owned a shotgun and mm -hmm. a 30 30 as well. Never really used any of them. Right. The 22 I used for target practice, and we both learned how to use the uh, pistols. Mm -hmm. The, I guess, when we went hiking in the woods sometimes in New Hampshire, I took a pistol with me, simply because I didn't know what I was going to meet in the woods. Right. Um, but I never had a shoot anybody <laughs> it was the the pistols we have are locked up the 22 is it's in a place where no one knows <laughs> um why am i saying all this i guess what i'm saying is i don't have an aversion to people owning guns okay. back to the thing about honor there's no honor in killing anything um, I think though, given my upbringing, that there was honor in overcoming evil and that honor was meted out with a pistol, six shooter. I, I agree. You know, I've entered into this discussion uh, through, uh, through Twitter and in, and in real life with, with various people, but I, I really find uh, it interesting uh, when I'm engaging with, uh, with people on Twitter from the U.S. And the one thing that I really find is there is a significant cultural difference uh, between Canadians and Americans when it comes to their attitudes towards guns. Uh, I was raised, uh, and everybody that I knew was raised, um, around guns, but we saw them as a recreational tool. We didn't see them as being necessary for personal protection. Uh, we didn't carry them for, for that purpose. Um, gun ownership in Canada is a privilege uh, versus a right. Um, owning a handgun in Canada <laughs> is a very uh, complex uh, process, number one. And number two, uh, you don't have the freedom to carry one around the way you do in the U.S. So we see, or I guess my, uh, my attitude towards guns has always been, you know, much more from a recreational perspective as opposed to, you know, seeing it as something that's necessary for my personal safety or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and I see that being a huge difference <laughs> when I'm dealing with or talking with my, my friends in the US. Well, I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't know that I saw a gun as initially as a recreational tool. Okay. I see a gun as a tool. Yeah. Um, that's how I see it anyway. And 
like any tool I have, there's appropriate use for the tool. Absolutely. Um, I can understand a gun being a recreational um, item. I, I used to like, you know, shooting my BB gun and knocking over tin cans or, or the same thing with the 22. Um, but I've come to have such a, I guess it's a, I don't want to say loathing, but that's the word that's coming right. to my mind. Yeah. We live here where people are walking around in public with semi-automatics that look like assault weapons. Yes. Um, they're wearing all kinds of multiple pistols, knives, you know, flash grenades. <laughs> I don't know what else they're carrying. You know, they're going to buy stuff in, in a deli with this. Yeah. I see that, that that really freaks me out. And I see that as a move toward fascism in this country. Yeah, we don't have that issue uh, in Canada. Um, carrying uh, a weapon in uh, the open is forbidden, uh, number one. Uh, number two, we don't have, uh, you. Legally, you cannot carry uh, uh, a sidearm or, or a pistol uh, around. Um, again, I think it goes back to what I was saying before. It's the cultural difference. Um, I have no understanding at all why somebody needs to you know, have a, a semi-automatic rifle on their back when they go into a deli. I mean, I don't think a submarine sandwich is all that uh, dangerous on <laughs> <in> the border. <laughs> Well, my comment about Anna, um, I guess maybe I was not using the best word I could use, but I, all I was really saying in a different way was guns have their place and I don't see any place for guns in public being paraded the way they are now. I, I agree. And I also think we... In this country, we have a lot of murders and we have a lot of suicides, gun violence. And I, I don't understand that. The, I was raised in Brooklyn. Brooklyn wasn't a, a walk in the park. No. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you had a problem, um, maybe you'd have a fight. Um, in school, <laughs> in the courtyard in school, I think a rite of passage over my eight years in grammar school was probably three or four fights. Somebody mm -hmm. would do something. Most everybody I knew, that was their experience. Um, but the thought of pulling out a gun, uh, using a weapon, was abhorrent. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was um, even when you were dealing with a bully, right? The, the, the expectation if there's the word honor is gonna come into it, the expectation was if someone is, is bullying you, stand up to them. There's right. honor in standing up to a bully, whether or not you win the fight. It's just, right? It's yeah, I was taught uh, very early in my uh, school years that I was not a fighter. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I was not much of a fighter um, after grammar school. I had, I can think of maybe two occasions when something happened, neither of which I wanted. One time in Charlottesville, we lived in Charlottesville and um, late at night, someone was banging on our door and Jess was an infant. And I took out a pistol because it was like someone was banging on our door like they were gonna crash through the door. Mm -hmm. And then I, Put it down on the table because I realized I'm not about to shoot somebody who's banging on the door. Even if they're banging on the door for some crazy reason, I don't want to have a gun in my hand. Um, so Kathy picked up a pistol and she was at the other end of the room. <laughs> and I opened the door and dealt with the lunatic who was at the door and no one had to get shot. But I have no doubt that if he had 
clunked me over the head or had done something like that, Kathy would have shot him where he stood. Um, I've worked with the people. Would, Go ahead. The other thing that would concern me with that, though, is how many times in a similar situation would other people be shot or would people actually just start shooting? I have a real issue with this easy access <laughs> to guns because yeah. not everybody has the discipline or uh, the training to, to use it properly. And I think that there's just all sorts of unnecessary, unneeded violence that occurs just simply because people have easy access to them. That's just my opinion. We lived in Brooklyn and then we, my parents bought a house on Long Island mm -hmm. as I graduated eighth grade. So the summer after I graduated eighth grade, we literally lived in a slum in Coney Island. And um, in that environment, I remember waking up one morning and there was a guy dead on the porch next to us because the cops had shot him off the chain link fence he was climbing and he oh. fell onto their porch. I remember going out to the, the, the bungalows, if you could call them that, were in an alley facing each other and you walked out the alley to the street. I remember walking out to the street, waving to someone across the street and a hatchet came down from the balcony above and just split his head. Um, I remember a friend of mine's brother being shot to death by the police uh, who came to the apartment without a warrant um, and shot him. He didn't have a weapon. So my concept of people coming to the door at night, <laughs> it's, not, it's not like always, hey, this is just someone looking for directions or needs to use the right. phone. On the other hand, I'm very aware of the fact that if I have a weapon and I get scared, I might use it. Right. So I don't, I don't carry one, I don't want one around. I walked, <laughs> I worked, when I worked in Long Island, I worked at a, a clinic, right? And two stores down from the clinic was a hardware store. And I went to buy a mall to split wood, right? right? And a mall has a big head, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm walking out of the hardware store, I have the mall in my left hand and I'm walking and as I, come past the building before I get to the next building, there's a, an open space there and there's a German shepherd on a heavy chain that just comes flying at me, right? And I'm watching this because it, it had a, a little bit of distance to travel. It was like <laughs> coming at me. And the only thing I could think to do was move them all from my left hand to the right hand because I was afraid that if this stupid dog hit the mall, it was gonna break its jaw or hurt its head or something like that, right? right? So <clears throat> I'm, I don't have any desire <clears throat> to hit, hurt, anything like that. Um, guns make it too easy. I worked as a clinician for a good deal of my life in, in Two days ago in Dover, where we used to live, there was a home invasion and three guys broke into someone's house and they pistol whipped the couple and they did whatever else and they left, They're still looking for them. I had more than one client I saw who had someone in their family killed during the home invasion, mm -hmm. um, where someone just came in, shot people, the police assumed it was drug related and it, and it wasn't in either case. It took years for them to find that out. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be scary to have people coming in unexpectedly. Um, but I don't think that's the reason to be killing people. <laughs> I, I agree. You know, it sounds like my experience um, is quite a bit different. Um, I grew up in a small town. Uh, gosh, I, I don't think we even locked the doors. Uh, obviously, I have you know seen violence, uh, but it's not uh, a, it's not a common uh, thing at all. So I guess my 
you know, attitude uh, towards a lot of that stuff is maybe, you know, somewhat gentler because I've just never experienced it in, in my own life. I mean, I'm, I'm not naive. I know that it happens, uh, but it just hasn't been my experience. Um, and that could very well just be the difference in, you know, being raised in a small town in Western Canada versus being raised in uh, Brooklyn, New York. So. How diverse a population would you have in your small town? Um, population would have been, I would say, not diverse at all. Um, right. We had, um, uh, no, it, it would have been well, well over 90% uh, <laughs> Caucasians. I mean, okay. it's just a small town. Did, did you have Native Americans in, in your? We did. Um, uh, there are, is a uh, First Nations uh, reserve about 15, 20 miles away from uh, town. Um, but the, the kids uh, from the First, uh, the, so the First Nations had, I believe they had their own school. Uh, but if they didn't, uh, they would have gone to school in another community beside or aside from the one that, that I lived in. So, uh, you know, there was a few uh, that, were, that were, you know, in school and that you got to know and, and everything else, but, uh, you know, they were definitely, uh, you know, a very small minority of the overall population. Did you have any animosity between groups where you were? Um, I would not say animosity, um, but there really wasn't a lot of, of, of mixing or mingling either. Okay. You know, they kind of stuck to themselves. We stuck to ourselves, uh, you know, in hindsight, um, you know, it's very different uh, than, than what it is today, but that was, you know, kind of the norm back in, you know, the late 60s, early, early 70s. And one of the things that I've learned as I got older is that, you know, I, I've learned how many things in life I've had to unlearn. Uh, because, you know, as you get older and as you get more experiences and, and you, uh, you know, you go out into the world, you find out that, you know, not everything that you were taught um, was necessarily correct. Um, so, yeah, um, that's, again, that, that was my experience. Uh, yes, we had, uh, you know, we had uh, a small native uh, population uh, in our hometown, but at the same time, they pretty much stuck to themselves. We stuck to, to ourselves and uh, it seemed for the most part to be fairly harmonious. Canada has a national government. Yes. It has the equivalent of states or provinces, I don't know. Uh, yes. So we have provinces, uh, whereas in the U.S. we have states. So Canada has 10 provinces and we have three territories. Huh. Uh, uh, the territories are you know, located up north. So there's the Yukon, there's the Northwest Territories, and then there's uh, Nineveh. Um, one of the other things, too, that I do find very you know, interesting uh, in conversing, especially with you know, people in the U.S., uh, I'm really starting to appreciate and understand the differences uh, between our system of government uh, in Canada versus the system of government in the US. Uh, one of the things that I think is a real advantage uh, in Canada, and I'm certainly not going to suggest that Canada is perfect. We're, we're a long, long ways from that. Um, but criminal law in Canada is handled entirely at a federal level. So the for, so criminal law is exactly the same everywhere that you go in Canada. Um, guns, for instance, are covered under criminal law. Um, so the gun laws are exactly the same uh, everywhere throughout the country. I see that being a major difference in the U.S. where it seems like every state has the ability to determine what their own particular laws are which you know, I think contributes to you know, a lot of inconsistencies and, and that sort of thing. Um, I understand why it's done that way, um, but I think especially when it comes to stuff like you know, gun legislation and all that kind of stuff, I think there is an advantage uh, in Canada by having it at the federal level. Did 
did Canada ever have slavery legalized? Um, you know, we did, I believe, but to a very small, uh, a very small degree. Uh, Canada's history, early history, uh, largely occurred down east. So it was Ontario, Quebec. Um, we certainly didn't have uh, slavery to the extent uh, that the that the U.S. did, um, but at the same time, I mean, I'm certain uh, that you know we had you know, small pockets of it. Uh, you know, we have certainly um, not done right uh, by uh, by our native uh, population. We've got you know some some definite uh, bad history uh, when it comes to that. To, to that sort of thing. Was slavery legal after Canada was formalized as a nation with a constitution? I don't believe so, Brandon, but that is uh, is not something that uh, I'm, I'm completely aware of, of either. Slavery was not really something that we ever talked about in Canada. We talked about, you know, we understood how you know, slavery occurred in the US. We understood that part of the history, um, but, whether it didn't happen uh, to any great extent in Canada or whether we just glossed over it <laughs> is uh, something that I'm really not sure of. How about suffrage? Were, were women afforded the same rights once Canada was formalized as a country as men? Um, no. Um, and again, I'm not uh, certainly not an expert on that. I remember, though, there's a couple of uh, very small towns um, that you know I'm familiar with, uh, and the old hotel. So the the, the bars in in Canada all used to be contained in, inside of the the local hotel, and there's a couple that still to this day, and I think they've kept it up there for historical reasons. Uh, but mixed drinking, uh, so the women <laughs> weren't allowed into the bars actually. Um, I was born in 1961, and I think it was very shortly before that. Uh, and some of the old hotels, you can still see, they had separate entrances. So, so there was the entrance for the for the men, and then there was the entrance for uh, for men and women. Uh, so if you were coming in with your wife, apparently you went through a different, again, well before before my time. And I remember hearing the stories, but. Uh, um, so no, I mean, they certainly didn't have uh, all the rights uh, that um, from the outset uh, of Canada that it's been a it's been a, it's been a gradual. Did women have to basically advocate for their right to work uh, to uh, to vote in in Canada? I believe that's the case. You know, it's kind of embarrassing that I really don't understand or don't know a lot about this history, but uh, uh, I don't, uh, I, I believe that women did have to uh, to fight for the, the right uh, to vote uh, in Canada. I'm guessing you never had a civil war. Uh, no, no, we did not. We had, uh, uh, no, not anything that I would call a civil war. Uh, we had uh, a rebellion uprising um, with uh, the, the Métis uh, versus uh, the, uh, the Canadian, uh, the RCMP or the police uh, at that point in Western Canada. But uh, we certainly never had anything like, uh, like the civil war down in the US. When we were in New York, right? Um, Black people were universally um, abused. I don't know, but you know, they were discriminated against. When we moved to Virginia, um, same thing. We moved to New Hampshire and we were on the border of Canada. We were up in Colbert, New Hampshire. And there were no black people in, in New Hampshire. So the people that were discriminated against in New Hampshire were French Canadians. Okay. Um, when we moved to Colorado, uh, there was a, a mixed group, but certainly um, two other groups joined in terms of discrimination. One was uh, Native Americans, and the other was various forms of people of 
Spanish origin, we had Mexican, we had, there were three, I can't remember them, but my friends in Colorado explained to me the difference between the three groups of people who identified to varying degrees as Spanish, um, some from Mexico, some from Europe, some from, I don't remember the third, <laughs> um, but there was always seemed to be some group that was on the outs. Did you have anything like that? Uh, we would have definitely had that um, uh, with the native population. Uh, discrimination, um, very common, still very, very common. Um, again, growing up, um, I just thought that was just the way it was. I mean, uh, you know, like I've explained to uh, to a lot of people that I've met uh, over my life. I mean, if somebody tells you that you know this is called a chair, and you don't meet anybody that tells you anything different, you start to believe that it's a chair. Okay. And it's only until you know uh, you get different experiences that you start to find out. Okay, well, that's maybe not not quite right. But to say uh, you know that we don't have discrimination. Uh, not true. We we do have discrimination, but it's well, largely against uh, the native population. In that context, yep. were those people cast as dangerous to you? Uh, growing up, definitely. Um, I was under the impression that you you know just stayed away from them, <laughs> which I don't know where I, I don't know. Obviously, it must have been just. You know, my parents were not, uh, you know, overtly racist or anything, but you certainly pick up on on what their what their attitudes are. And again, I mean, small town. Everybody I knew felt the same way. I assumed that that's just the way it was. How do you all feel about all of us coming up there during the Vietnam War? <laughs> uh, well, that was, um, you know, I was pretty young uh, at that uh, at that point in time. I mean, I would have been. You know, at the time of the, of the draft Dodgers coming up to uh, to Canada, I mean, I was eight, nine years old, <laughs> kind of thing. So, again, it's something I've I've heard about, but really never never experienced. And the vast majority of uh, of the draft Dodgers would have come to Eastern Canada. Uh, so, being in the West, it was not something that was you know, we were commonly uh, exposed to, or or something that we talk about. Prior to World War II, did you ever have a pro-Nazi movement in Canada? A large pro-Nazi movement? <clears throat> Not a large uh, pro-Nazi uh, a movement. Um, that certainly not that I'm aware of. Uh, okay. I, I've never heard of it. Um, I mean, obviously, you're going to have your your supporters of every wing nut thing that there is out there, but it's not you know, to any significant uh, to degree. Did, did, is that the case um, in the U.S.? Fun. Was that the case in the U.S.? Oh yeah, yeah. We had we had Bunds, Nazi Bunds. Mm -hmm. Charles Lindbergh was a pro-Germany uh, coming into World War II. You know, he okay. was against us going to war. He was basically wanting us to have peaceful relationships with Hitler. Um, I think once war was declared, he may have taken a different stance, but prior to that, in New York, there's um, there's some famous footage of a big Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden, I believe. The yes. old Madison Square Garden. Yes, there were giant banners of George Washington and Adolf Hitler and Nazi flags all over the place. And people were doing heils and there were, Nazi speakers, and one guy got beat up in the audience when he tried to speak, you know, to the people mm -hmm. on stage, and was carried out. When I went to college, I went to college in Oakdale, which is on Long Island, Suffolk County, East End, and um, it was fairly rural. And it turned out <laughs> my friend Wally comes across this treasure trove of pictures from prior to World War II. And there was Oakdale and Sable and Patchogue, um, all Nazi buns 
or not all, but there were a lot of Nazi buns. There was the, the picture that really stood out for me were Nazis at our local train station waiting there for the train to come in to greet some Nazi dignitary. Um, my friend Steve, who I went to school with, he rented a house in Oakdale, rented an apartment in a house in Oakdale. And I rem and I, myself and John, we rented an apartment in a different place, not in a private house, more of an apartment house. And one night Steve came over and said, can I stay? And we're like, sure, what's happening? He said, I went home and my bags were packed. There was an envelope with the rent I had paid. And there was a thing, you know, we don't want Jews in our house. And if you have any integrity, you'll leave. Um, that was, uh, that was in the 60s. Um, I, in terms of prejudice and also violence, I remember during the Vietnam era, when, when the protests were going on in our country, I remember demonstrations where people were getting beat up, people like mm -hmm. me, <laughs> and the police were okay with it. Um, I, I certainly remember black people not only getting mm -hmm. beat up, but killed. I dropped out of college after Watts erupted in Los Angeles because mm -hmm. I wanted to see Watts. So I drove to Los Angeles and I drove through Watts and Watts was like a war zone. It was like leveled. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there were there were so many. We had a history. I don't know if you've had assassinations, but we had assassinations starting with John Kennedy, right. Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, Malcolm X, several other students, Kent State, things like that. I don't know if you had any of that stuff. No. Um, you know, we've we've obviously had some uh, difficult uh, incidents, uh, but certainly not to the extent uh, that uh, was experienced in, in the US. The other thing I remember getting back sort of to guns, but I think this all is related to it because it's an atmosphere you grow up in and you're talking about the difference in the way people are in Canada around it as opposed to the way people are here. Mm -hmm. um, I remember as a kid, right? You, you go see Walt Disney. Uh, mm -hmm. Treasure Island, and the pirates are shooting each other, and they fall over. No one is bleeding. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's like bang, you're dead. Okay, yeah. and it was clean. And then I remember, I think it was coming into the the '60s. There was a movie with Ernest Borgnine, uh, Alan Ladd. I think was in that. I may be wrong, but it was. Um, it was the Wild Bunch. And the Wild Bunch was a Western. And they shot people and you saw them explode. Blood was flying. They slit someone's throat. You saw that go down. And that was a radical change, right? That was, that was um, shooting people wasn't clean, right? right? Shooting people was dirty business. Yeah, now you're seeing the real consequence of it. Right, yeah. And then the other thing I remember, which was a shocker, I was in high school and Psycho came out, Hitchcock's Psycho. Mm -hmm. And I went to see Psycho. And now we had, um, you know, we were already at the point where gun violence is being graphically depicted, but now we have people stabbing people in the head and what have you multiple times with a knife and that became, um, it, it, that I guess started the slasher films, I don't know. Right. But I, I see all of that, our, our, in our movie industry as normalizing violence or desensitizing us to violence. Um, the first time, the guy who fell on our porch, if the police shot him down on the on neighbor's porch, the bungalows were one building divided in half. Okay. So one side of the porch was our neighbors, the other side was ours. Our neighbor was against the fence. Mm -hmm. That was a shocker. 
right? Right. That was not, you know, that was like, whoa, well, you know, what am I looking at? This is not, I'm not taking this in stride. Um, today, I think it is taken in stride. I think people are comfortable shooting other people mm -hmm. because they've seen people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, kill, I don't know, 20 people in three minutes in a film. Right. Uh, or Sylvester Stallone, you know, these kind, of, or any number of them. So I think what Hollywood has done in, in interest entertainment and selling entertainment has, has normalized violence, desensitized us to violence. Um, <laughs> And again, my my opinion and, and my opinion only. I mean, I've I've grown up, uh, you know, watching uh, watching the movies and, and all that sort of thing. Um, I never ever had a problem though discerning the difference between a movie and real life. <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> what uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, an actor does on screen. Uh, is certainly not uh, the way you know people are supposed to behave <laughs> in a civilized uh, society. And so, while I can watch that and I can be entertained by it, um, I, I don't have, I, I don't believe that it's real life. Uh, number one, it, it's strictly entertainment, um, and it desensitizes me maybe from an entertainment standpoint where I can you know watch graphic violence without wincing or anything but at the same time I'm not uh, you know certainly going to go out and say well this is the way that I should be handling my problems but that's how desensitization works it's not that you're necessarily going to do it but if you see enough of it experience enough of it and now you're reading about it in your community it's like oh well yeah and I guess I, you know, relatively, uh, you know, it sounds like the difference um, uh, between, you know, your history and my history. Uh, number one, I think that 15 years makes a big, a big difference, <laughs> especially coming through the 60s. I mean, I was so young uh, coming through the 60s. And again, in small town Saskatchewan uh, or small town, it, it's just you just don't see it. Um, it doesn't affect you nearly to the degree. Um, you know, my parents uh, were, were hardworking people, um, but really didn't have a whole lot of interest outside of just raising their family and all that sort of stuff. So it wasn't something that we talked about or saw, or I learned a lot about until, you know, much, much later on. Um, also didn't experience, uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, violence. I remember when I would have been, oh gosh, maybe 19 or 20 uh, years old, uh, there was a murder in, uh, in my hometown. Well, that was, that was a huge deal. Uh, I mean, this, this was just unheard of. Um, so from that perspective, uh, you know, I, I certainly wasn't desensitized by, you know, the activities that were going on around me that, you know, started to think that that was normal because that wasn't what, you know, I experienced uh, in real life. When we lived in Colorado, we lived in, in Boulder, mm -hmm. which was north of Denver. But when we lived in Colorado, Denver was for a short time the murder capital of the United States. I wasn't aware of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Shoot em ups were common in Denver, really mm -hmm. common. I want to go to something else, but I want to just know we found this. We used to go to see things in different places we live, and we found this little museum in, mm -hmm. in Denver. And we thought, wow, this is this tiny little thing. And it was mostly photographs and clothing. But was what was just stark was the photographs, a lot of them were of Ku Klux Klan parades down Main Street in Denver, led by the mayor. And oh. the airport there was named after the mayor who was prominent in the Klan. Um, but going, jumping, the mm -hmm. other movie that uh, I'd like to just mention in this context, yeah. was The Godfather. Yeah. Now, I'm Italian-American. 
Okay. Raised in Brooklyn. What can I tell you? Um, I saw The Godfather, and I, I read The Godfather. I read other books by Puzo, yeah. primarily Fools Die. But I, I thought The Godfather was an excellent movie. Yeah, okay? One of my favorites, actually. But I, I looked at the, the, the gangsters as thugs. You know what I'm saying? They were not heroes. They, there was nothing honorable about anything they were doing. You know, and yet I'm watching that movie. I'm in a theater, and there are people really rooting for the mob. And then after that movie came out, Italian restaurants started getting named after various monsters or right. things like that. Um, it was, I was actually upset with the, I was really upset with Italians in the audience. It's like, mm -hmm. Are you kidding? <laughs> These guys ain't the good guys. You know, the only thing I, I responded to in The Godfather, which got me mm -hmm. in, in terms of, okay, was when, uh, when Michael um, was beat up by the police captain, yeah. right? And then, uh, and, the, and the police captain was corrupt, right? But I knew, not necessarily gangsters, but I knew people who were beat up by the police. I did not feel any sense of loss when the police captain was shot in the head by Michael Coleon in the movie. I, that was kind of like justice, but even that's a little bit weird. But for the most part, I looked at that as um, insight into this group of people, but not, they weren't heroes. I didn't understand them being made heroes. I didn't understand so many people wanting to emulate them. And a lot of the violence we have now in, in cities and things like that, I think um, we have role models for it. Right. You know, I, I remember, I remember right. watching, uh, you know, The Godfather. Uh, loved, loved the movie. Uh, right. Absolutely loved the movie. Uh, but I didn't have any problem figuring out who were the good guys and the bad guys. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> people, were, it's not the case here. Yeah. One of my friends in 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 college, <coughs> his uncle was a a really famous mobster in New York mm -hmm. um, and was shot to death in a barber's chair. It was, you know, he, if you watch the old know. things, he's there. His family, they changed their last name, right? They did not want to be associated with mobsters. Right. They didn't, didn't want that. Um, but yet I, I see so many young people and I've, I've worked with a lot of people who've been having problems. That's what I did. And I see so many young people who think that um, that having a gun is makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a status thing or a macho. I don't know how to a totem, if you will. Yeah. So I don't understand that. And and that's part of where I was going with this no honor and shooting yeah. someone, right? It's just it, I mean someone standing in front of you and you have a gun and you shoot them that's you haven't done anything noteworthy or you know um yeah. worthy of of a claim you've killed somebody even in war i worked with so many veterans um, so I, actually when i first started working i was i had a group of veterans i was working with in a hospital and they were World War I veterans. So I've worked over the course of my life with World War I, World War II, Korea, the Gulf War, Vietnam. And none of the guys I knew thought killing anybody was honorable. Right. You know, there was nothing. But yet, if I look at our war movies, <laughs> right? I used to like John Wayne as a kid, and then he he did a pro-Vietnam war movie, and he did 
And then he was a speaker against the anti-war movement. And I, I really started to resent him. Mm -hmm. um, but th there's so much in our culture, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. that glorifies guns. I don't understand it. Yeah. And, you know, I, just from our discussion and from what, you know, we were talking about earlier, that is something that I really notice is a huge difference uh, between Canadians and Americans uh, is that there seems to be, uh, lack of a better term, uh, a worship of, of guns uh, in the U.S. that, you know, has never been my uh, never been my experience uh, up here in Canada. I guess, you know, we've had a, a very, my experience, uh, again, was, you know, they were, they were dangerous, they needed to be respected and all that sort of thing, but they had a very specific use uh, and it was not uh, to be used for violence or, or power or, or anything else. So I think, you know, to a large extent, uh, you know, when I responded to your your note on Twitter the other day, um, you know, I'm responding from from my experience, and that's how I how I see that. Um, your experience obviously sounds much much different, and I guess had I you know grown up uh, within that, likely my uh, my my opinion would be would be different as well. But you know, we're we're a product of our environment, right? I mean. Uh, I always, um, uh, you know, I, I never experienced uh, the violence, never, never saw that. Um, just a very, very different, uh, just a very different experience, which, of course, you know, shapes, uh, shapes your beliefs. And again, I think going back uh, to what I was saying before, uh, you know, I think that that's a general cultural difference uh, between Americans and Canadians. And in Canada, yes, we largely see firearms as being, you know, for recreational uh, purposes, as opposed to you know, being necessary for our survival, <laughs> it seems like a lot of Americans feel. The, the, um, I'm just curious. One of the things, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of uh, football. Okay. Yeah. But, I'm a huge football fan. <laughs> okay. Well, football or soccer, what are we talking here? Oh, no, well, when I say football, I mean American football. <laughs> okay. So, but I look now, I look at football, and I think this is kind of a step or two removed from the Colosseum in ancient Rome, you know, where, where people are going to see people like smash into each other. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with boxing. I don't, I don't understand that. Um, I, I, the last thing I want to witness is somebody smashing somebody else. That doesn't doesn't do it for me. Mm -hmm. With, with um, violence in, in general, I'm not a hunter. I don't have issues with hunters if they're hunting to eat. Yeah. I have issues with trophy hunters. I have a real issue with trophy hunting. Okay. A real issue <laughs> with that. Killing for the sake of killing is just immoral as far as I'm concerned. But that's part of the gun thing. Right? It's like, I'm powerful. These people go over to Africa, shoot up an elephant. Shooting an elephant seems to me to be like shooting a barn, you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't see the sport in that uh, at all. But, you know, again, that's something that I would, you know, I would have absolutely no interest in number one, doing. And number two, I, I don't understand what people get uh, out of that. You know, to uh, you know, to go hunting as a food source. Um, yeah, I completely, uh, I completely understand that, and I, I have always enjoyed uh, hunting. The part of hunting that I enjoy the least uh, is the actual kill. <laughs> That's really not the reason. Or not the you know the whole reason uh, that I'm out there, and it's I've passed up uh, a lot of shots over the years just simply because you know what 
I've had a great day. <laughs> right. You carry on. <laughs> the, the worst situation I've been in where people were shooting at me <laughs> was in the woods in New York, upstate New York, in the Catskills. And it was during hunting season. I was walking with two of my friends down a country road through the woods on property they owned. Okay. And there was the road was a little bit lower. There was a swale, and then the ground was a little higher on the other side of the road, on either side of the road. Um, and we're walking through it, and just what I remember vividly was some twigs flying off the trees, branch yeah. flying. There was certainly the sound uh, and the sense of whooshing, um, and people were shooting at us. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding? We jumped into the swale and we we're screaming at them, you know, and right. then they came up and they apologized. And, you know, my inclination would have been to take their rifles and bash them over the head with it because you don't apologize for almost killing people. Right. You're, you're in the woods, right? You shouldn't be shooting something if you don't know what you're shooting at. Absolutely. That's very irresponsible. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, during hunting season, <laughs> on the first day of hunting season, at the crack of dawn, it was like a combat zone. The sound of it was like, I don't, you, no one could have been seeing that many animals. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I thought maybe there were groups in the woods shooting each other. Maybe there was some separate war going on in the woods. The farmers used to paint cow on the side of the cows. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I've I've heard the I've heard those stories. Um, I remember uh, years ago. Uh, now, uh, can't remember whether we we had been out hunting or or what. But anyway, we were in this uh, little small town tavern having a, a beer before we came home, kind of thing. And there was a group of uh, American uh, hunters that had been, you know, out for the day. So, you know, we're just making conversation, like, you know, hey, how was the day? And, you know, and the one guy distinctly said, he said, it was a good day. He said, I had a couple of good sound shots. Like, I, I don't even know what a sound shot is. Oh, I heard something in the bush. Like, like, are you kidding? Like, are you kidding? Like, remind me where you're hunting next because I don't want to be anywhere near uh near that area but again and i think there's you know when it comes to hunting there's a very there's a responsible way of doing it and there's a very irresponsible uh way of doing it and i have you know absolutely no time or patience uh for people that do it uh irresponsibly i mean that, that's dangerous to to I don't, for no reason i don't see hunting as sport oh okay i i, I don't know if people talk about it uh, I certainly <laughs> I don't see hunting with it, what, an AR-15 as, you know, a sport, you know, unless the deer are charging you like 40 at a time or something. Right. When we lived in Maine, in uh, New Hampshire, a woman in Maine was hanging clothes on her line in the back of her house, right? And it wasn't treed. And she was wearing white fuzzy mittens and she was shot and killed by a hunter. And the hunter argued that he thought the white fuzzy mittens were a deal with deer's tail. And he, he, he was acquitted. Uh, I yeah. don't. Yeah, I, I don't know what the circumstances around that was, but it certainly sounds like a bit of a stretch <laughs> to say that that was, you know, done uh, done responsibly. So. Yeah. The other thing I did in New Hampshire, I was working with a group called Save the Moose Coalition. Okay. And we had had a moose hunt prior to the beginning of the last century that almost exterminated the herd in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So there was a moratorium. You couldn't hunt moose in New Hampshire. And um, that went on for, I don't know, close to 80 years. 
And then a group of hunters wanted to bring back the moose hunt. And the group I ended up working with, they said, we don't want to see the legislature approve or disapprove of this hunt until they've gone out and done a survey of the herd. Yeah. Um, and the legislature wouldn't do it. And, and the moose in New Hampshire are, they're not in abundance right now. Right. I don't know if they've managed to maintain it at the level it was at, but it was not at a good level at the point we were active. But when I was active doing that, um, people were threatening me. <laughs> threatening me. <laughs> they were going to shoot me, shoot my family. Um, crazy stuff. So, just so that I understand, so uh, the moose hunt, was that like a, a general open, anybody could go buy a, a license and go moose hunting, or was it done on a draw basis? It was, uh, th there was a permit required, and there were only so many permits, and I don't remember if it was a first come, first serve, or if it was a lottery. I oh. just don't remember, but but there was that. Um, but the thing was, the group that I was representing wasn't, wasn't anti-hunter. It was for not hunting the moose until we knew the herd had come back to a point where it could sustain that's, it. That's responsible conservation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then in political things, for lack of anything better, political, uh, when I worked at a hospital in New York, psych hospital, which was terrible, and I was an advocate for changing conditions, I was, people were calling me up at night, threatening me. Um, my tires were flattened at work. Uh, in Virginia, another psych hospital, they, they fired me and several of the clinical workers in my department for reporting patient abuse. And we went on the offensive in terms of taking the state to task over that. And one of the guys I, I work with, Don, he and his wife lived in a colonial log cabin in Stingy Hollow, Stanton, which wasn't all that different from what it was originally. Right. And his, his uh, mother and father were there with his two children uh, watching them. I think it was a Saturday. And Don and Marianne were doing something away. And I think they were doing something with us and some other people who had been fired. Mm -hmm. Um, and a pickup, like out of the movies, pulled up, backed up to the porch where his parents, who were older, are sitting with the two kids. And there are three guys in the back of the pickup with shotguns aimed at the parents. And they told him, you better tell your son to, to knock it off. Um, a little bit <laughs> about the world. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I live in. I, I have big issues with guns. I have big issues with guys who need, or gals who think they need to carry guns for whatever reason. Um, if the few times I've been in a fight in my life, it's because I had no exit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I would have no problem if someone, you know, came up to me and said, or whatever, just walking away. I, I was, back in college i was actually managing the door polite term for bouncer but it wasn't a particularly rough club on the island and uh, a guy came in and his brother and his brother's friend had come in with false proof they were like 16 and i said i'm sorry i can't admit you and they said come on and i was like no and they left and they got angry and they came back with his big brother and two of his big brother's friends. And his big brother, whatever this guy had told his brother, the big brother was coming to, to make it right. And he came in and I think it was $2 admission, right? And he's handing me the $2. I'm sitting down, he's standing up with two other guys. And he says to me, you look like a real cocksucker. And I said to him, 
I said, wow, I said, thank you. I said, I'm not a cocksucker, but so many people come in here and they don't even take a moment to notice me, to have a thought about me. You at least took me into consideration and had a thought. Thank you for recognizing my existence while I sit here at the table. And the guy looked at me and this was priceless because he turned around and like slapped his brother in the head and said, this guy didn't do anything to you. You know, he told you probably get out of here because you didn't have, but this guy is not basically a bully. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times I've been in situations where you, you can just walk away. But one of the things I think we had that really changed things in this country prior to the elections, when Trump was elected, was in Florida with Elian Gonzalez, right? And Florida enacted a stand your ground rule. And Zimmerman had a gun and shot Elian, who didn't have a gun, and killed him and got off on stand your ground. It's like I... we had this whole thing. It's like it's wrong to walk away. It's demeaning to walk away. It's not honorable to walk away. That is uh, one thing that, you know, as, a, as an outside observer, <laughs> I just do not, for the life of me, understand this stand your ground uh, mentality at all. I mean, it seems to me like what you're saying is, is that you don't have to uh, you know, figure out an alternate way to um, solve a, a problem you know, just turn everything into a, a gunfight at the OK Corral. Uh, just an absolutely foreign concept <laughs> to me. And, and how people justify that, uh, you know, I will never, uh, I will never understand. You know, it's interesting, uh, you know, prior to COVID, um, I traveled down into uh, the U.S. a lot. I spend a lot of time down there, uh, or was spending a lot of time down there. You know, I'm never ever at home. Uh, I'm never worried about getting shot or somebody <laughs> pulling a gun or or whatever. And it, you know, if if I'm if I am worried about that, I, you're obviously in a place that you, you you probably shouldn't be. But it's interesting. As soon as I cross that border, my spidey senses are on full alert. <laughs> uh, you know, just. I, I'm just aware that this is a distinct possibility, you know, far more so than it than it is at, at home. And you know, whether that's just you know hype or you know, being a little bit oversensitive or or whatever the case may be. But yeah, it's something that I'm always aware of uh, when I am down in in the U.S. And it's something that very seldom ever crosses my mind here. I mean, I conduct myself exactly the same way, but. For the most part, I'm comfortable, but on the road, I'm keenly aware I could get shot because someone doesn't like the speed I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. And I think I said Elian Gonzalez in Florida. It was Trayvon Martin, in case Trayvon. Of, who was shot by Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, there are certain places I'm not going at night. You know, um, there are places I avoid like the plague. We, we had a, a bar in, in uh, Dover, which is the state capital, um, was just recently closed because the amount of violent outbreaks in the bar <laughs> became excessive mm -hmm. and the town closed it. It was, and I think, who goes to a bar like that? Why would someone go to a place knowing that there's a high probability of violence? Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't quite, quite understand that. And we, we have the same things in Canada, um, in certain spots. I mean, there's, you know, Edmonton is um, a city of, you know, with uh, the surrounding communities. Uh, Edmonton's a city of you know, just over a million people. Well, there's definitely uh, bars, uh, areas of the city that, uh, you know, I don't want to to go into just because I mean why put yourself in harm's way for for absolutely no reason uh when I lived in Toronto there was definitely uh 
you know, areas that you, you didn't go into. There was definitely, you know, places that you just, you know, you just didn't go into. Um, I think it's probably my impre impression could be wrong, but my impression is I think that's a lot more common uh, in the U S <laughs> than, than what it is. <laughs> uh, you know, I've spent, um, uh, during my career, I, um, uh, served on an advisory uh, committee for uh, one of our suppliers. So I actually spent a number of, uh, of days a year uh, down in the U.S. at you know, various meetings, and, and they were always in you know very large you know centers. Um, and the, one of the things that I always found interesting down there is that there would be a an area that was very safe right beside an area that was not safe at all. And then there's another safe area and then another unsafe area. It seems like Canada, it, it's, it's a little bit easier to figure out where the, where the good areas are and the, and the bad areas are. Um, but they just seem to be so interdispersed or interspersed uh, in the US. I, I just found it interesting. I, I think I have a, a fairly accurate perception of what our country's like, the good and the bad. But ha so having said that, in my wildest dreams, and the worst nightmare I ever had, I could not imagine someone like Donald Trump being elected as president of our country. And that man, I think he took, you know, he was running from Benito Mussolini's playbook, if you study. Yeah. Wrong. And I don't understand our citizens voting for him. That, How was it in Canada? What was your perception? I mean, did you think we were whack jobs for voting this guy in or what? Uh, I have absolutely, I have always uh, believed, again, my opinion, I have always believed that uh, Donald Trump is just the biggest crook uh, that has ever <laughs> walked the face of the earth. Um, you know, by the same token, uh, I will admit uh, that, uh, you know, in 2016, um, I, I can't say that I was a fan uh, of his, uh, but at the same time, you know, some of the stuff that he was saying sort of made some sense. Um, I admired Barack Obama as a person. Uh, I didn't care for his politics uh, at all. Um, I've always leaned uh, towards conservative uh, politics. Uh, that has, you know, just that's just my bend. Um, being a Canadian conservative, though, is quite a bit different than being a U.S. <laughs> conservative, especially since 2016. Um, but I found with Trump after he got elected, uh, you know, it didn't take very long before I thought to myself, you know this is even worse than I expected. Uh, I think I was probably one of those, you know, people with the naive idea that he was actually going to, uh, you know, honor uh, his role as a president uh, and that he would actually grow into uh, being presidential. It just got worse and worse and worse. Like, I, I, and I could never understand, and I still to this day don't understand the blind allegiance so many people have to this thug. <laughs> so, did, beyond me. Did you get to see like the news reports of his campaign rallies prior to the election when he won? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, he was talking real crazy rhetoric at those things. He was saying about beating up people. He yeah. paid the expenses. That to me was, that was new to me. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I honestly believed, it turns out that I'm wrong, but I honestly believed uh, at one point in time that that was just like a, an act for effect. Uh, <laughs> you know, surely nobody that's running for president can be this loony. Uh, but at the same time, I guess that's, you know, what it takes to uh, excite the crowd and get the votes and you know, whatever have a ball but it turns out i mean what we what you saw or what i saw like oh my god this is the real thing like this <laughs> this is what this guy is all all about not that it surprised me at all um but i couldn't believe that he uh, he actually rose to become 
president. And I can't believe to this day that he has as much uh, influence oops, uh, in the U.S. on uh, within the, the Republican Party that he does. I mean, it, it's just unfathomable uh, to me. Did you have anything in Canada equivalent to like our Oklahoma City bombing or the Branch Davidians or the people down in Waco, Texas, movements where people were either destroying large things or cloistering themselves, <clears throat> arming themselves and living? You know, I, I'm sure we have. Uh, there's nothing that uh, is popping into my head uh, at this at this moment in time. Um, you know, we've had um, we've certainly had incidents uh, across Canada, but but again, you know, nothing to the extent uh, that uh, that we see down in the U.S. Now, Canada is 10 percent of the population of the U.S. You know, so obviously there's going to be you know. There's going to be a lot more stuff uh, occurring down there than, than what's up here. But my opinion and my opinion only, I, you know, I think we're just a, a kinder, gentler <laughs> country in, in a lot of respects. Uh, and certainly, in, you know, speaking generally, I mean, we're, we're far from perfect. Uh, you know, we have pockets of issues and, and problems and, and all that kind of stuff. But, it, you know, it just doesn't seem to be, in my opinion, and perhaps it's naive, others, you know, are going to be watching this and saying, you know, I, I disagree with Gary completely. Well, I, and that's fine. It's just my, my opinion. But yeah, I, I just see our attitude towards everything being, you know, a lot more kinder, gentle, you know, live and let live. Uh, to to a large extent. I mean, it's creeping. A lot of you know the Trumpism stuff it is starting to creep into Canada. I think, but it's starting to creep. It seems worldwide. I can't believe that this guy has that kind of influence. But. The, the, in terms of gun ownership in Canada, yeah. do people buy assault weapons in Canada like they do here? Well, you know, and uh, I actually have that uh, marked down. That's an issue or an area that I wanted to talk about. Um, so let me explain just at a very high level uh, what happens uh, or how gun ownership works in, in Canada. So in Canada, you have to be licensed uh, with the government in order to own a firearm. And there's different, there's two basically, or two basic different classifications. Uh, one is called non-restricted, one is called restricted. In order to get a non-restricted license, which means that you're able to own non-restricted weapons, which is basically hunting rifles and shotguns and 22s, that, that kind of stuff, um, you are required to take a course uh, you have to complete an exam at the end of the course, and you also have to demonstrate proficiency. Um, once you have that in place, then you send your application uh, off to the government, uh, who then determines whether or not they will issue uh, you a license. Uh, so basically, it consists of uh, background criminal checks, all that sort of stuff. Um, you have to provide references. Uh, if you are married, they will contact your spouse um, as to whether or not they're comfortable uh, with you issuing the license. But that whole procedure will take, you know, three to four months uh, at, at best. You know, I've heard of it being done quicker. I've also heard of it taking a lot longer. Uh, so then once you have your license, um, then you can go and purchase a gun, but it's only until then. Now, the next classification is restricted, which is all handguns, certain uh, types of, of rifles and all that kind of stuff. Those are considered to be restricted weapons. So in order to get a license to own restricted weapons, you take another course, 
Okay. Uh, and again, with the exam and the proficiency and you make the application for it. Now, the difference between a non-restricted and a restricted weapon, uh, restricted weapons are all handguns uh, in Canada. Restricted weapons can only be used at uh, licensed gun range facilities. So you can't carry them around. You can't take them out hunting. You can't do anything with these things other than drive them directly from your dwelling to a licensed firearm facility. And you have to be a member of a club uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to, to purchase uh, a gun. Um, and in addition to all of that, so of course it's very, very restrictive. I have a restricted license. I don't own a restricted weapon uh, at this point in time, but I do have a restricted license and you know, I don't want to go through the, taking the course again and stuff. So even though I have no interest right now in my gun, I keep my license up because I, you know, I don't want to lose it kind of thing. But the other thing that happens here that's very different is and I believe it's non-restricted as well, but certainly restricted, uh, is you are scrubbed against the uh, database on a daily basis. Right. So if I get charged uh, with a violent crime, that is immediately uh, flagged that I have a restricted or a, a you know, restricted uh, possession and acquisition license. Um, Guns, you know, you'll be getting a you'll be getting a visit <laughs> very quickly. All of a sudden, that uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You you don't uh, you don't qualify anymore. But you can do that too because you have a national police force, right? Well, we can do that. Yes, uh, I, I think that makes it easier, and I think it also, uh, again, going back to to what I said quite a bit earlier. You know, criminal law in Canada is handled at a federal level. So the laws are exactly the same, you know, every square inch <laughs> of the country. Um, and yes, we do have a national police force. <coughs> Excuse me. It's um, uh, the, um, the license registry is a division of the, the federal government and, and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it's, um, there's a lot of... But again, it's a, it's a difference between a privilege to own a gun versus what's considered to be a right. <laughs> Just to be clear, are you all allowed to own like an AR-15? Uh, an AR-15 has always been a restricted weapon. Okay. Okay. Um, now they've actually moved them to the banned uh, category, which okay. is a whole other uh, issue, but... Um, but yeah, they were um, previously they were under the restricted, uh, so you could only use them uh, at a at a licensed gun range. The interesting thing, though, is, um, and I, I have a real, I've, I've got gotten into this debate on on many occasions with many people. But what is the definition, or what is your definition of an assault rifle? Okay, I, I, I'm real clear about this, okay? Okay. We had an assault weapon ban yep. under Clinton. Yep. And when we had that in effect, whatever weapons were on that, right? Yep. Whatever weapons were on that, we didn't have the mass killings with those weapons <laughs> that we have once it's lifted. So right. <clears throat> right off the top, I'd say anything that was on that list, but to be more specific, I, I know the difference between a semi-automatic and, and a non-semi-automatic weapon, right? Yep. And I understand that most military assault weapons can function in a fully automatic mode. <clears throat> that Bruce being Bruce said, the, so the assault weapons we're selling now <clears throat> are semi-automatic, right. but they can be easily converted if you know what you're doing to fully automatic. And even without converting the mechanism, you could get a bump stock and do what that guy did out in Nevada and, and shoot up 50 people because the, the repercussion is, is doing it. 
Right. Um, so there's that difference. But the other thing is the ammunition. Yes. Right. So <clears throat> the ammunition, I believe, is the same as the military ammunition. Um, yeah, it would be the the ammunition is. I don't know because I don't own an AR-15, but I mean, I've, I've seen the ammunition in the, the sporting goods stores uh, here. To me, it looks like no different than what you would use in a legal rifle uh, of the same of the same caliber. Well, I kind of I'm not sure. I had read something on this, but it's been a few years, and my memory's not good, <laughs> but. I believe that the ammunition in those can do a lot more damage than say a 30-30 or 30-06, which are popular. Uh, no, I would actually, I would actually disagree with that. Okay. Most AR-15s are, to be honest, uh, most AR-15s are a 0.223 caliber. That's right. Small head. Small Very board. small head. Uh, those are illegal, uh, even if the gun itself was legal. It's not big enough to be used for big game hunting in Canada. Okay. And big game hunting in Canada has to be done. Most pro or any province that I'm aware of, it has to be a 0.23 caliber or larger. So, you know, the AR-15, number one, is not considered to be, you know, um, a, a large enough uh, weapon. Uh, to be used for big game hunting. But one of the other big differences in Canada versus the US is our magazine capacity laws. In Canada, any rifle or all rifles uh, cannot have more than five cartridges or five bullets at any time. Um, we don't have you know, the, the 30 and 50 uh, capacity <laughs> magazines that you see down in the States. To me, that uh, would be a major step in the right direction. But I mean, that's just just my opinion. Uh, to carry thirty uh, rounds uh, with you in Canada, um, you know, you'd have to carry twenty five of them loose in your pocket, uh, or, or else have you know six clips. Six different clips with you, or, or magazines uh, with you. Um, you know, you're probably not going to be able to to do near the damage that um, that what you could do down in the states, where you have you know basically an unlimited supply of uh, of firepower available to you. But the big difference that I find, or the, I mean, the definition of an assault rifle to me, and assault rifles in Canada have been banned since 1977. Um, is the ability for auto uh, or burst fire. Uh, and none of you know, the guns that we have here uh, have that. What I find frustrating when I'm having a, this discussion with, uh, with people is their definition of an assault rifle appears to be based entirely upon how it looks. So yes, this AR-15 looks like some big scary thing that you would see in a war movie, but it has none of the capabilities <laughs> of a military <laughs> rifle. It is the same as your grandfather's hunting rifle. It just looks scary. Except, okay, here's, here's where there's a difference. Okay. When I see all the right-wing groups mm -hmm. marching around these days, yep. None of them are carrying 3006, right? They're, or Winchester 3030s or Remington. They're all carrying assault rifles, what or what we refer to assault, as assault yeah, rifles. Assault looking rifles, yeah. Right. So I think they appeal, right? Yeah. Um, and for me, I'm I'm perfectly comfortable with frustrating all those people. <laughs> if if that's what appeals to them, all the more reason to stop it. Mm -hmm. It's it's. I think it gets back to um, allowing people to feel empowered because they are holding something that's lethal, mm -hmm. and I don't think we should encourage that. We should allow that. Um, I'm maybe saying that poorly, but I think if some <laughs> if someone is not going to walk out on the street 
without a weapon or not even with a 30-30, mm-hmm. but they'll walk out with something that looks like an assault rifle, then I'm for stopping that, right? Just nope. If that's if that's what we have to do to prevent you idiots from being out on the street, well, that's what we have to do. Yeah. It, it, it's 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 not a rational thing. Um, I, I agree. And I mean, I would question why, I mean, number one, I don't care for the, I don't, I don't care for the looks of stall style radicals, but that's just, you know, personal preference. Um, but the AR-15s, I think, appeal, number one, because they're big and scary looking, and, and these people you know, seem to, to like that sort of thing. I think the other thing, too, though, is that, um, uh, you know, they carry the the high capacity magazines, the ad, you know, the average 30-30. I've never, you know, I'm sure you can get them, but, you know, you commonly aren't seeing, uh, you know, 30 bullet magazines <laughs> <laughs> for that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's something that uh, appeals. Uh, but again, you know, Canada has kind of resolved that issue by restricting magazine capacities. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of a gun it is. This is the maximum amount of uh, rounds of ammunition that it can carry at one time. Uh, rifles are rifles are five. Uh, handguns are ten. Uh, that's just the way it is. We not only don't restrict magazine capacity in a lot of instances, we allow things like silences. Yes. I, I always wonder why does someone need a, why does someone need a Help weapon me. that looks like an assault yeah. weapon that has the capability of putting a bayonet on, by the way, and you could also throw a silencer on there for good measure. What is what's the point? Yeah, I, I don't I don't quite understand it. You know, I, again, I think one of the biggest differences uh, between our two countries, though, is the fact that you guys have or the second amendment um which makes it very difficult uh as far as as i can tell makes it very difficult to implement any kind of you know rational um restrictions uh and the other thing you know in addition to that is that seems to be under state control uh, so you're going to have 50 states doing 50 different, uh, 50 different things. Um, Canada is a very different, very different situation. When we moved to Virginia from New York, New York, you couldn't own a pistol, right? Oh, okay. Without special, really special stuff. You drove across the border, right, into Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're coming down south. And in Manassas, I think, on the right, was a big gun place, right? You could go in there. I could could buy 50 guns. Um, We weren't allowed here in the United States to track those weapons by serial number. And those guns, people were coming from New York, buying 50 of those things, driving back to Manhattan and selling them on the street. But we couldn't trace the sources of the, the pistols because our laws prevented it. Um, so it made it hard, right? I mean, the, the difference from state to state was a joke. But the other thing, which is more, I think, insidious, I don't think most of us here understand our own constitution and how it was formed, how it was put together. Mm-hmm. So I think the Second Amendment, I think our constitution, was a mutual defense pact between slave and non-slave states. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time to get a constitution because slavery was an issue. And then our brilliant forefathers resolved it by saying, oh, well, we'll we'll just leave it alone. It'll be legal. And, but the slave states wanted all kinds of assurances. And part of that had to do with the admission of new states, the house, the Senate, um, the Electoral College, all those things had a lot to do with making slave states comfortable that no one was going to ban slavery. Mm-hmm. The Second Amendment, I see in that context, right to have a militia. 
-hmm. So this, the slave states wanted the right to have their own armies. You know, this, and then eventually they seceded and, and we had a civil war, but that, that's where, that's where that comes from. I don't think that there would have been a need for a second amendment if, if we didn't have legalized slavery from the get-go. Um, yeah. <laughs> the question that I would have on that is, did the U.S. even have a standing military at oh, yeah. the time yes. of the Second Amendment? Yes, we had a standing military. You did? Yes. Yeah. Because one of, I, I guess I was, one of the impressions that I was always under was that um, the primary reason for the Second Amendment um, correct me where I'm wrong here, um, was because there wasn't a standing military and the government did not uh, want to have a situation where somebody could come in or, and forbid uh, people from having firearms because those were the people that they were going to need <laughs> in order to defend the country uh, if there was a surprise attack by England or, or whoever. Well, I, I think that's inaccurate, but I, I, I'm not, I should have Nick with me here. He can answer that better than I, but I believe we had a, a national army. I believe that the second amendment was really there to protect the rights of the slave states in case of things like secession. You know, when Hitler geared up, right? He, Germany wasn't allowed to have an, an army like it used to have. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't allowed to do that. He had troops tra training with shovels, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that was all in preparation for taking over, which they did. But I, I think the Second Amendment, right, was to ensure that they wouldn't have to be training with shovels. <laughs> they could have a militia, um, you know, at will. Um, the challenge I see with the Second Amendment uh, is that it is so broadly written. Uh, I, I think there's been, my personal opinion, I think there's been some very generous uh, interpretations <laughs> of, uh, of the meaning uh, behind it or the intentions behind it by the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, it makes it virtually impossible uh, for you know, any rational uh, <laughs> laws uh, to to come into place, and then compound that with the fact that you know you're going to have 50 states doing 50 different things. Um, do, do you I, have, I think there's an advantage in Canada with our system. Over that. I, I I would agree. Do you, <laughs> do you have organized crime in Canada to the at, at least to the extent we have it here? Um, we certainly have it. Uh, without a doubt. Uh, is it to the same extent? Well, again, Canada is 10% of the population of the U.S., so you know, we don't have anything here to the, to the same extent. Uh, but yes, uh, it's, it's prevalent, uh, you know, with, um, for lack of a better term, with, uh, you know, the mafia organizations, with uh, the biker the gangs, that sort of thing. So you have drug, drugs in Canada, heroin, Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Canada's got a very significant uh, drug problem. And like every Canada, other country. In terms of the, the government, um, is the government hard on that, that group? Uh, hard on uh, drug traffickers and that yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah. One of my criticisms of Canada is that they're not very hard on anybody. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, going back to uh, to guns, just briefly, um, our government, you know, recently introduced a whole whack of guns that are now considered to be, or that are now banned, uh, versus previously they were restricted. Well. You can pass all the laws that you want, and it was being done, uh, or it was done in response to you know the amount of gun violence that uh, was being seen primarily in in Toronto, uh, but it's, it's everywhere. Uh, so the response to that was to ban these guns. Well, 
But that's not the problem. I mean, it's only affecting law-abiding citizens. Um, where Canada falls down, as far as I'm concerned, is not that we don't have sufficient laws or we don't have the right laws. We just don't enforce the damn things. <laughs> and you, you can pass all the laws you want, but if you don't enforce what you've already got, uh, another law is not going to help. You know, we have a significant uh, gun violence problem, specifically or pr predominantly in, in Toronto. Well, the, the vast majority of those weapons are illegally being smuggled in from the U.S. And they're certainly not, uh, you know, being used by licensed individuals. I mean, it, they're going to, you know, the, the criminal gangs. Uh, the guns are coming in illegally. Uh, that's where there would be uh, benefit in focusing efforts as opposed to you know, coming up with more feel-good laws. The challenge that, and the frustration that I have uh, in a lot of cases is we have, in Canada, you have the people that are gun owners, but we're a minority compared to the majority of the population. Uh, and there's so little understanding uh, with the, you know, the non-gun owners. Uh, as to what our laws really, really are. Uh, our media, our television, all that kind of stuff uh, up here is dominated uh, by American media. So many of them believe that our laws in Canada are exactly the same as what they are in the States. Well, it's not even close. Um, but because it's not something that really interests them, uh, you know, they have no in most cases, they have no interest in becoming a gun owner. Uh, they have no interest in actually learning. So they see these bans as being, you know, some you know, magic uh, thing that's going to suddenly make their life better with no understanding that, no, uh, the people that you needed to fear yesterday are the same people that you need to fear uh, today. Uh, but getting that across <laughs> Is, you know, it, it just seems to fall on on deaf ears. We, have, you know, I think we need education, but how do you educate somebody that has no interest in learning, um, kind of thing? And if you have no interest in owning a gun or whatever the case may be, uh, do you really give a damn? <laughs> the laws are even more restrictive. I know you've mentioned a couple of times you have a smaller population in Canada. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I don't know this, but I'm going to take a wild guess that your violence in Canada is not proportionate to your population as our violence is to our population. You know, I would, I don't have anything that would back that up, but I think that's correct. <laughs> I stand to be corrected entirely on that, but I would agree with you. I don't think that we have uh, violence to, you know, near the, the proportions uh, that the U.S. does, even, you know, adjusting uh, for, uh, for the difference in population. Is, is Canada part of, I don't for lack of a better term, the British Empire, the Commonwealth? What, where is Canada vis-a-vis -vis England? Yeah, we are uh, we are part of the Commonwealth. Okay. Um, now we are uh, we're a constitutional monarch, uh, okay. which we have absolutely no dependence at all, <laughs> other than symbolic. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the head of our government. Uh, most people are surprised by that, but the head of our government is not the prime minister; it's the governor general. Uh, the governor general is uh, uh, a political appointment and the governor general functions as uh, the representative of the queen, but it's an entirely symbolic uh, position. They have no uh, ability to, to make laws or, or, or anything else. It's, it's just part of that. That's a whole other discussion as to whether there's a benefit in being part of the Commonwealth or not. Let me ask you a different question, different topic. Sure. 
Are you involved in the financial industry? I was involved. I was a commercial banker uh, okay. for uh, 35 years. Okay. The, um, I track the, the stock market here. I yep. track the Dow every day, several times a day. I don't have yeah, anything invested in, in the market. <laughs> I never have. Yeah. The only reason I track it is to point out graphically using a non-biased metric, right? Mm -hmm. What I consider to be the absurdity of the market because it's flying all over the place. Um, and I'm, I'm just, do you have the equivalent of a market up in Canada or are you oh, working absolutely. off? Okay, you yeah. do. Yeah. Is it as crazy as ours? Pretty much. Yeah. Do you have a national bank like we uh, like we do? Um we have the yes, we have the, the, the Bank of Canada. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and which, the, is which the bank functions of, basically is the feds. So okay. And they're allowed to print their own money, their own currency? uh yes the bank of canada is the one that, that does that does do you have uh fiscal policy and monetary policy uh yes uh we you know we call them you know different things but yeah i mean we have largely the same system uh in place uh in canada that uh that you have down uh down in the u.s did you go through what we went through, say, in 2008 and then coming into March of, of last year? You know, it, that's it, it's interesting. Uh, no, we did not. And the reason that we did not is, number one, uh, we have national banks in Canada. So we have, you know, we have credit unions, we have all that kind of stuff as well. But there's really... The, the big five. Uh, there's five major banks that operate across Canada. There's a couple of smaller, uh, more regional. Uh, but we operate, uh, in order to be a bank in Canada, you get a charter under the, the Bank Act. This is all about 25,000 feet, <laughs> this explanation. Uh, and under the Bank Act, uh, the government regulates um, you know, basically how you do business. And one of the things that uh, the Canadian banks complained about was that we were very, very restricted under the Bank Act uh, as to what we were able to do uh, as far as you know, expanding into you know, other opportunities and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we really thought that that was unfair and that we were being very hard done by and all that kind of stuff. Well, 2008 hits, we see the wisdom now. <laughs> okay. We did not experience near the issues uh, that, uh, that the U.S. did within the, within the banking system um, at all. Um, just again, because... You know, we operate under, you know, under very conservative terms and conditions. <laughs> we think, you know, we used to think somewhat, they were somewhat too conservative and you know, we see the American banks and they're, well, you know, these guys are just really able to take advantage of this opportunity. Wouldn't it be great to be able to do that? Well, then you see the downside as to, to what happens. Uh, have you had anything even close to 2008? I mean... Do you have res uh, recessions? Is that a we did? I mean, we had certainly had a recession. Um, you know, we're still you know, kind of fighting through it, uh, but it, it was not nearly as. One of the things that I find about Canada is that you know we're you know our lows aren't as low <laughs> as right. others, our highs aren't as high. <laughs> so you know we sort of go along on a little bit more of a more of an even of an even keel uh, here. So, I mean, yes, I mean, I mean, we certainly had the same issues with COVID and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, our, uh, our banking our rules, our banking laws uh, are much, much, much more conservative than did, what they were in the US. Did you have, or do you have anything in Canada that's akin to say Enron? Um, Probably not to the same extent. 
Uh, you know, we certainly have had uh, uh, some some fiascos, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, nothing that I can think of to uh, to the same extent as as what an Enron uh, was uh, at all. Um, you have any equivalent to Bernie Madoff? Uh, nope. <laughs> Again, no, I mean, I'm not going to say that we don't have unscrupulous money managers or uh, unscrupulous uh, uh, financial advisors, but certainly not to the extent of, uh, of, of a matter. Is gambling a problem in Canada? Um, I, I guess you'd have to define a uh, problem. I mean, you know, we have gambling across Canada uh, guaranteed um, from the banking uh, world. Um, yeah, I saw firsthand a lot of people that ran into some very serious problems uh, with, with their personal uh, gambling uh, habits. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's an epidemic uh, and I don't think it's you know, necessarily, but I guess, you know, if you're in that position, uh, where, you know, your spouse has gambled away the, you know, your life savings and all that kind of stuff, of course, you're going to think it's a, it's a problem, but yeah, I, I don't, we don't really have anything to the same, like we don't have, you know, we obviously have, you know, casinos and, and, and that sort of thing, but we, I mean, we certainly don't have anything that I would consider to be on the same level as, you know, Atlantic City or, or Vegas. So. How about, I don't perceive myself to be greedy, mm -hmm. okay? I, 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 I never aspired to be a millionaire, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It was like, it wasn't necessary to be a millionaire to be okay, to, mm -hmm. to li live a comfortable life. A lot of, a lot of my contemporaries, yeah. they're still thinking <laughs> they're gonna become millionaires. And I'm like, what's, What's the need? What's driving you? Is that, so I guess what I'm saying is I see a lot of people who are almost addicted to the concept of becoming a millionaire, making it big, you know, living life large. That's an aspirational thing, I think, here. Is that the same in Canada? I think you would find the same thing uh, in Canada. Uh, Alberta, where I live, is a uh, very entrepreneurial uh, province. Um, you know, that's a, that's a very, very, uh, very common uh, sentiment. I don't think, uh, I, I, anecdotally, I would tell you that I don't think Canada is much different. Uh, okay. Than US. But, and some of the things, I don't usually get to talk to people from Canada, um, but you got nationalized health insurance, don't you? Uh, nationalized healthcare, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that that works. Um, it's not perfect um, at all, uh, but uh, I think for the for the most part, uh, it does. Um, you know, being nationalized, um, uh, you know, it's paid for the most part. Uh, you know, everybody has access uh, to. Uh, to healthcare um, because it's funded by the government though. I mean, one of the things that we do run across is, you know, uh, waiting times and, and that sort of thing. I mean, the system does get, get overburdened. But. We had a significant problem here with bankruptcies where people yeah. were go declaring bankruptcy, losing their homes because of medical bills. I'm guessing that's not a problem in Canada. No, medical bankruptcies are not something that you hear about in, in Canada at all. And how do you treat your seniors? How would I fare in Canada if I was? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think uh, we probably treat our seniors um, okay. You, you probably have to talk to a, <laughs> to a senior. Yeah, to do a do senior. you have the equivalent of like Social Security? Of course, yes. Oh, you yeah, do? We, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have old age security that kicks in at, uh, I think it's age 65. 
Um, you know, we have the Canada Pension Plan, plus you have your health care and, and that sort of thing. So, so, so is it fair to say you're a bunch of wild socialists up there in Canada? <laughs> I guess you'd have to define what a socialist is. <laughs> you know, um, I know a lot of Americans look at Canada and say, you know, well, that's socialism. Well, no, no, we're we're a capitalist society, the same as with the U.S. We just, you know, we do have more social programs uh, in place. I think, you know, for you know, the very average people, I think that they would have a far better. This is just my opinion. People will disagree, and that's cool. Uh, but um, I think for a very or for very average people, I think they would have a better lifestyle in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> under the programs and whatnot that we have in place. So uh, in, in elections, I, one of the things, this used to get me, especially when we moved to Virginia, which was 1980, mm -hmm. I watched elections go down, local elections, okay. and the whole, the whole debate was who was more conservative than the next. Okay. So do you folks have these concepts of liberal and conservative you do. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's getting to be more pronounced, um, you know, over. But uh, I was on when I'm on Twitter, uh, quite often I'll refer to myself as a Canadian conservative because I am a conservative uh, by Canadian standards, but not by American standards. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you... Do, how about libertarian? Is that a concept for you? Um, what would be, okay, what's your definition of libertarian? Aside from insane? Um, <laughs> <laughs> libertarian, as I understand it here, okay, yep. it is, uh, is somewhat of a sham. The Anne Rand was a, a popular novelist. Mm -hmm. She was writing... And the, the big one, right, that everybody seized on was Atlas Shrugged. And she was, so a group of what I would consider um, more plutocrats as opposed to conservatives mm -hmm. seized on that, right? That became a good propaganda thing, her concept of economy and meritocracy, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So today, a good deal of the Republican Party is, uh, for lack of a better term, libertarian. Uh, they like to call themselves conservative, but if you scratch the surface, you're dealing with the propaganda that was put out when the plutocrats seized on Ayn Rand as a good um, justification. We, we had, I read a book, um, oh, I can't remember. It's called Friendly Fascism. Mm -hmm. It was written in early 1990, I think, around there. The guy who wrote it was involved in our government in the administrations prior, uh, definitely under Truman, Eisenhower, I think possibly under Roosevelt. He presented a thing which made perfect sense, right? And it was that we have our plutocrats and they don't care about social policy, they don't give a hoot and a holler. They're just as happy for Democrats and Republicans to go after each other because they're distracted from what they're doing in terms of policy, which has to do with resources and international things. Um, and he was basically saying, he was describing them as friendly fascists. Mm -hmm. um, we had, around the time that came out, we had, uh, a family, at least one, but in particular, the Koch brothers, yeah. and their family owned the largest privately held oil company in the world. Mm -hmm. And they got politically active. They got other wealthy people in. And they started, they wanted to get into social uh, policy. And they, they really embraced Ayn Rand. Okay. They, they, they went hog wild. And that evolved, and they constantly evolved their strategy. Um, they were responsible for the Tea Party, mm -hmm. okay? and they 
I think they're more responsible than say Donald Trump for what we're seeing here in terms of the way our citizens behave. Trump just made it okay. Uh, but, but they, and they were surprised, they didn't want Trump. Um, so, but, but the libertarians are really the mantle the Koch brothers operate under. Do you have concepts of meritocracy over there? We do, um, you know, and, you know, using that as your definition of libertarian, yes, we certainly have a small faction uh, of that. Uh, it's not, uh, I wouldn't consider it significant. I think, you know, a lot of people on the left side of, uh, of politics make far more out of it than what they're, what it really is. Uh, yeah, um, there's, there's some of that, but it's certainly not uh, significant. And I, I don't think that, you know, something like, uh, I don't think that philosophy would ever completely take hold uh, in Canada. That's just not the way we're built. <laughs> we, we seem to be, you know, a kinder, gentler uh, nation. And our social programs are, are important to us. And we, we, you know, we see value in that. Uh, we believe that that's our, you know, largely our responsibility uh, towards uh, towards our citizens. So, you know, it's just it's just a, a very uh, a very different outlook. What's your take on Brexit? You know, I really have not followed uh, that uh, all that much. I mean, it really does not have you know much of an impact uh, to me. Uh, so, you know, I have followed it, but gosh, I'd probably be even be lying if I said I followed it at 30,000 feet. <laughs> so okay. I, I kind of understand the plot. <laughs> that's, that's, okay. about, that's really, really about it. The, it. Do you, I'm just trying, I'm picking your brain here, but yeah. the, we had the big communist scare here in this country, right? Did you have any equivalent? scare in Canada? Well, again, I would have been pretty young uh, okay. at that point in time. Um, you know, there's, again, much like the libertarians, I mean, yes, we have a group uh, or a small group that would, you know, really, you know, sort of believes in, in the, the communist uh, ideals and, and all that sort of thing. But again, they're not, it's not a, a significant uh, thing. Um, one of the things that I chuckle about a lot, uh, especially in my time on Twitter, uh, is listening to people from the U.S. Uh, defining or providing their definition of what communism and, and socialism is. I, I think it's just absolutely hilarious. But it has been uh, those have been scary buzzwords for a long, long time. And all it seems like all the, the political parties have to do is just especially the, the Republicans, all they got to do is just throw out the word communism and everybody gets their, gets their hair in a tizzy. So. so you're a capitalist. Yeah. The word socialism doesn't terrify you. Uh, not true socialism. Uh, no, uh, no. It, it, I'm quite comfortable uh, with, uh, with, with what we do in, in Canada. I think, you know, in some cases, we're uh, probably a little bit more generous than what we need to be. I think in other cases, we should be probably a little bit more generous. But, you know, one of the things that I really find interesting, and in I'm not sure about yourself, but I, I found for me uh, that as I got older, I started to become more and more liberal. <laughs> So, you know, definitely took on a more of a, a live and let live and, you know, hey, how can I help you out? <laughs> In Canada, it, I'm just, average person, are they up to their eyeballs and dead or living paycheck to paycheck? Um, I would, uh, I would suggest yes. Okay. Or I would say yes, uh, that they are. Um, uh, the Canadian government uh, you know, it's recently been in, in the news, but the Canadian government is becoming uh, concerned uh, with the levels of, of debt uh, that, uh, that Canadians are, are carrying uh, now. Uh, there's been you know, a couple of changes over the last couple of years on uh, um, 
you know, the mortgage rules, you know, basically making sure that people have got, uh, you know, some skin in the game, uh, that they're not getting themselves over leveraged. Um, we have uh, our real estate market in Canada. Uh, we have um, we have Vancouver and Toronto that the markets are, for lack of a better term, just insane. Uh, I mean, it, it's just absolutely ridiculous uh, what real estate is going for uh, out there. And a lot of it, uh, in my opinion, a lot of it is driven by foreign investment, um, which fine, um, you know, nothing wrong with that. But if something ever happens, uh, the book, you know, the air comes out of that balloon pretty fast. Uh, and now you're going to have a whole bunch of people uh, that are really getting hurt uh, by it. So, uh, you know, the government has tightened up uh, the rules around, you know, the percentages of, of mortgages that you're able to, to, you know, obtain. And how about credit cards? Do you have limits on the kind of interest that banks can charge on credit card debt? Um, yeah, there's legislation uh, in place uh, around that. It's certainly not uh, the wild west. They can't just charge whatever, whatever they want. Largely, though, that's all. You know, a lot of that is driven by market. Uh, we used to have usury laws. Yes. We don't have them anymore. Do you have anything like that in Canada? Um, yeah, the. Um, there are laws in place. I'm not very well versed uh, in them. It's never been anything that, uh, you know, I never dealt with it when I was in the, in the banking industry and I certainly never dealt with it in my personal life. So I'm <laughs> really not all that clear uh, as to, to what the laws are around that. Um, intuitively, I would think that our laws around it are a little bit tighter than what they are in the US. It seems like anything to do with financial services industry, everything's tighter in Canada. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think there are, I haven't checked, we don't have debt, but I believe there are some credit cards that are charging in excess of 20% interest. Oh yeah, that, that wouldn't surprise me uh, at all. Um, we would have, we would definitely have uh, credit cards here uh, that uh, are in excess of, of really? 20%. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, and that's just, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I think people have to take some responsibility uh, <laughs> for themselves. I used to believe that. Uh -huh. And I still believe people have to take responsibility. Yeah. But I also believe um, I believe we collectively have to take some responsibility for what we allow to happen. And I guess for the ignorance level that we, we allow our, our people to reach, you know, they're, they're restricting the way we, or want to restrict the way we teach history in this country. There, there is, when I was a kid, there was nothing in terms of um, economics or even budgeting taught at, at a level. I, I learned about business. I was um, in New Hampshire, what it was 90, 90, I'm done, 84 maybe. I started a corporation. That's the first time I learned about business in my life. I learned a lot. Um, but, and I was surprised. I was amazed by what I found. And I was surprised that this wasn't part of a normal curriculum, a orientation to both our government, our economic system, none of that. So one of my oldest friends um, who doesn't talk to me anymore, <laughs> he, um, I can't talk to him because he says things and if I'm honest in my response, he gets pissed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but he's running, he's three years older than me. He's running like somewhere between $200,000 and $400,000 in loss to gambling over the course of his lifetime. Oh, wow. He's married. They're both retired. They have good pensions. They still have a, 
a mortgage on their house, right? I can't talk to him about that because he thinks I'm whacked, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, but he's not uncommon, right? I'm uncommon. Mm -hmm. I, I, my thing, we live very comfortably, yeah. extremely comfortably. We have no debt. We own our home. We, whatever we have will go to our daughter and our grandchildren because we have no use for it. Mm -hmm. The money we have coming in is excess money. Um, the, the I see getting out of debt, staying out of debt as being a high priority. Yeah. Um, I'm not a gambler. Mm -hmm. I see the, the stock market I see as a form of gambling. So, so my advice to people would be, before you start gambling in the market, clear off your, your mortgage, get out of your credit card debt, you know, clear car loans, stuff like that. Um, then see how you fare, right? Um, but I'm not common in that regard. You know, one of the things um, I worked with, um... Uh, or one of the guys that I, I worked with very closely he took his uh, education uh, in business uh, down in the U.S. He actually played hockey uh, down there. So he's got a lot of you know, friends that he still uh, associates with and, and whatnot. Um, and I remember one of the things that you know, he was telling me, he said, he said, a Canadian lays in bed at night you know, wondering how they're going to get rid of their mortgage. An American wonders how they can get a bigger one. <laughs> you know, using it as an ATM. And I remember uh, right. Dan, they were having a, an adult beverage here not that long ago. Uh, he was down, he had been back uh, down into uh, Colorado, which is where he went to, to school. He met up with some with some friends down there. And he said, we were sitting around the table having uh, dinner. And his one friend said, you know, he said, my, the value of my house hasn't gone up enough to even make it worthwhile uh, remortgaging it. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, this is something that you're going to complain about. Uh, you know, it's not, again, it's, it's not, a, a, not an ATM. We see some of that uh, in Canada, but not near to the extent or nearly as common as what it is uh, in the US. It just, that just baffles me. Well, this is interesting. The, when, when the president, I think, who did more to damage our economy than any other um, was Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. And I think Ronald Reagan did a lot to damage it, but I think, Bill let loose some of the restrictions on financial institutions, which yeah. led to things. When I didn't know that at the time, but when when George W. was president, right, and things were getting crazy, and, and we were involved in Iraq, mm -hmm. and it wasn't funded, and all of a sudden everybody started remortgaging, right, and I thought we've just gone through a depression. I mean, what they're allowing people to do is remortgage and fake money's coming out, which they're using to buy things that keeps the economy going. But eventually this is gonna crash. And that was, that was my thesis. Mm -hmm. I was a critic of, of Greenspan. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was born out. What, what happened was they ran out of the ability to, to keep refinancing the home. They couldn't produce more cash. They just increased the amount of debt they had when they got the cash, right? They, they bought more junk. Um, th we didn't, the bill came due and we didn't have it. The economy right. crashed. That's, but that's what, what people do here. They think I can, I can sell my or remortgage my house, pull the money out, and I can live high on the hog for a while. I remember mm -hmm. writing a thing. But I don't that, understand how they think. And I know, I know that's what happens. But I, I just can't understand how people think that way. Like, do you not think at some point in time this is going to have to be repaid? <laughs> we're, we're idiots. 
This is an idiocracy at this point. I really, and that's where I go where people need to be responsible. But I think we've raised a gener not, I don't want to say a generation, I'll get the millennials coming after me or X or Z, but I think we have, have gotten to a point where we're generally stupid about practical everyday things. But I wrote a thing in response to, to, to this, and it was, uh, your house isn't worth more, your money's worth less, right? That made sense to me. I'm, I'm reading now some books by contemporary economists trying to keep up with it, right? So I read Donut Economics and I read The Deficit Myth. I like Donut Economics, Deficit Myth, I thought she's crazy. Um, but the, the, I try to understand this, you know what I'm saying? I, but none of this was ever, really presented to me at any point during, and I, I have a master's degree, I've, I've run agencies, no one was teaching anything. It wasn't, you know, you used to go to buy a car in the 60s, right? You go to buy, <laughs> I love the, go to buy a car. And the guy says, how much can you afford to spend each month? And I'm like, what do you care? You know, I, how much is that car? I, it's not how much I can afford to spend. It's how much does it cost and am I getting what I want for, for what I'm spending? Exactly. Yeah. People don't understand that. We have the same issues uh, here as well. I mean, financial literacy is not something that uh, is taught uh, to most kids in, in school. Uh, if they are exposed to it, it's uh, very... Uh, very general, very fleeting. Um, you know, I, uh, in my role as a banker, I actually put on a couple of presentations to, uh, to high school kids um, that, you know, I, I was happy to do it. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, that we just weren't able to dedicate nearly enough time. Plus it was a kind of a one hit uh, thing. The thing that surprised me uh, was, and actually made me sad was how little I think that they got out of it because they had absolutely no concept of, of what I was talking about. I remember one of the exercises I, I put them through or took them through uh, was, you know, uh, setting up a, an adult budget, uh, you know, with a mortgage and a car loan and a student loan payment and blah, 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 blah. So, explain to them from a banking perspective, you know, how we calculate uh, ratios and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So the first thing I did was get them to you know, go through, uh, at that point in time, it was newspapers. You know, go through a newspaper and you know, pick out a house and we'll figure out what your, what your mortgage payments are. So, you know, we, we go through that, right? So then I take them through the map of what, you know, an average car payment is. Okay, this is what your mortgage payment is. Da, 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 da. Well, do you realize that you would have to have this level of income in order to be able to, to, to do that? And they looked at me with, you know, blank stares. Well, yeah, doesn't everybody make that kind of money? Well, no, not people don't make three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. If that's what you're running into, and that's, I run into the same, right? Is it fair to say that people have to take responsibility if they've been raised to be idiots? Um, well, good point. Uh, you know, uh, they're making, in a lot of cases, I think they're making bad decisions. Um, but by the same token, I look at it this way. I mean, uh, and maybe uh, just... Uh, cold-hearted, cruel guy, but I look at it and think, you know, personal budgeting ain't that hard. No. <laughs> you got X number of coming in, and that's usually pretty easy to figure out is how much is coming in. Well, you can only have X going out. <laughs> so if you've got, you know, pick a number, um, if you've got $1,000 a month coming in and you got $1,200 a month going out, how long do you think this is going to last, right? And I remember, 
you know, many, many, many times, uh, uh, especially early in my banking career because I did uh, consumer lending. So I was you know, dealing with, uh, you know, individual finances and, and that sort of stuff. And uh, on a number of occasions, you would be dealing with people coming in, uh, you know, needing a consolidation loan or right. some you know, straightening out their, their finances. Uh, it surprised me how often they said, you know, we didn't realize we had a problem. Well, you didn't realize you had a problem because you hadn't ran at a limit on your credit card. Yet. <laughs> uh, the, I've run across people, a lot of people, who if I had the inclination, I could exploit mercilessly. Right? It, that would have been that I didn't need anybody to restrain me from doing that. I did that myself right. because that wouldn't be okay. Right? Um, so I'm just wondering, how is it that that doesn't play out in a larger context? How is it that our institutions or banking industry, car industry, home industry don't Take the same approach. You can certainly you can exploit everything, every last penny out of someone. But why would you do it? You know, it's like it, it, it's it's just wrong. So when I see people screwing up, and believe me, I see people who I used to see because it was my work, people screwing up royally. I, I on one hand, and I used to say, just so you know, mm -hmm. you know, this is your responsibility. I, I was unequivocal about that. You need to step up, start thinking as an adult and take responsibility. On the other hand, I felt like, boy, these people bought it hook, line and sinker and are, you know, this is what the American dream really is. You go bankrupt, you know, you lose everything. Um, I, I always felt there was, there needed to be some balance there. So in, in, in my field, right, um, th there was a lot of abuse of medication. Okay. And then there were consumer laws, and I'm not saying they're working, but it got a little bit better. You had to inform people about the medications they were gonna be taking. Right. Right? So I don't see the same thing in other areas and maybe we shouldn't have to inform people but if that's where they're at then ethically i think we do have to inform people can't let yeah. i'm not we're, we're, people kill themselves yeah we're certainly uh you know the financial services industry is uh, certainly obligated to provide far 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 more disclosures uh than uh than what we have uh or what we did uh years ago um you know is there understanding uh, <laughs> what we just explained to them uh, in a lot of cases, probably not, uh, or they're just not interested in, you know, they're, you know, they're wanting to do whatever it is that they, that they're wanting to do. And uh, I think about that more from, you know, the debt perspective rather than the investment perspective, but. The, the other uh, thing, I don't see everybody, at least in our country here, as being on a, a level playing field. So if I see someone being raised in an area, a high crime area, they don't have adequate schools, um, they don't have adequate medical coverage, they don't even have adequate food half the time, I don't see how they uh, have the same opportunity. And I, I don't see how they can maybe be held to the same standard as someone who's had a lot of opportunity, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Who's had a good education. Um, and I, I agree with that. Um, you know, I, I'm starting to get a much, much deeper, better understanding that, you know, not everybody has the same opportunities. And, um, you know, I'm starting to understand what is meant by, by privilege. Uh, I didn't, I thought, you know, everybody, you know, if you work hard and uh, <laughs> apply yourself, yeah, no, that that doesn't work as well for for everybody as it does as it does for others. As to not holding them to the same standards, 
You know, on one hand, I, I understand that. On the other hand, I, I don't understand, or I don't know how we would, how, you know, how we would do it. Um, you know, you, you know, somebody might not have, uh, you know, the education uh, to make what I would consider to be a, a rational decision, but at the same time, that's their decision to make. Uh, I, I, I was asked that? in New Hampshire to, by a, a superintendent of a prison to come in and do something because of the violence that was in the prison. Mm -hmm. And I went in and um, I won't go into the whole thing, but the gist of what I told the guys, and it was horrible, right? Prison, prisons are not nice places. And they said, is this fair? And I was like, probably not. And they said, do you think we should be here? And I'm like, well, let me, end. and I'm alone. I, I deliberately got rid of all the guards, which I had to get the superintendent's permission to do it for me to meet with them in large, <laughs> large group. I said, I'm on the outside. So I don't care what your reason is, but if you're committing violent acts or you're stealing or any, I'd rather you be locked up here than out where I am. Right. So from my perspective, um, whether this is a nice place or not a nice place, it's a good place or a bad place, um, that's second to, am I comfortable knowing that people who are committing crimes are being put in prison? They accepted that. Mm -hmm. they, they literally, they really accepted that. And I think they respected me because no one else was saying it to them. <laughs> But then we got to working about what everybody was doing every day in that prison and whether or not violence was in anybody's interest. And if it was, whose interest was it in? Was it in the majority of people's interest? And the violence just disappeared. Um, th now there had to be some systemic changes in the prison, which I was able to get done through the superintendent. But my approach to those guys all men was, hey, you're breaking the law. This is where you need to be. But you don't need to be treated less than human when you're here. But your, your treatment here is gonna be contingent upon your behavior here. And even if you're presented with unfair situations here, you need to learn how to react in a way that doesn't bring it down on your head. Mm -hmm. Right, and one of the things there was a farm involved, so the the guys would go out in the morning to work on the farm, and they'd come back. Well, the guards had it set up so you couldn't take a shower except at a certain time between this hour and this hour in the morning. The guys who went out to work on the farm went out before showers, came back yeah. after showers, couldn't take a shower till the end of basically a five day work week. Oh that God. was creating a problem, right? And they resented it. Well, as they articulated to me and I got, you know, the guards wouldn't change. I got the superintendent to change it like that. That had a big drastic effect. But my thing to them was all the stupid things you're doing in here <laughs> in response to that aren't working. All that's happening is more and more restrictive uh, situations are imposed upon you because you're attempting to deal with this through stupid means. Right. So articulate it. You've got someone here now as, a, as an advocate, so you're explaining it to me. Let me take this and run with it. But don't, don't use this as an excuse for creating craziness here during the evenings. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that worked. The violence yeah. disappeared. Well, so, I think, you know, I, I think that's true in a lot of areas. Uh, if there's a problem, I think we need to spend a little bit more time as society or understanding not the symptom of the problem, but let's understand what the underlying problem is. Mm -hmm. How do we fix that? Uh, and I think a lot of times we spend far too much money and energy, um, you know, just dealing with the symptom uh, as opposed to, you know, never actually attacking, you know, the underlying problem 
disease, whatever you want to call it, um, because you're never going to get rid of the symptoms if you don't attack the source and figure out how you're going to change that. That's where change uh, comes from. You know, it could be whatever it is that's causing the problem. Well, yeah, but, you know, that's because of, you know, something that's much bigger, uh, bigger than that. I've got one last question and then I have to head out, but we, we don't have the best relationship with our police in this country. Right. How is it in Canada? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I see that going on in, uh, in the U.S. You know, I have a strong suspicion uh, that the system in, or the system or situation in Canada is probably not a lot different. Mm -hmm. I've never had a huge issue uh, dealing with uh, the police. Uh, you know, despite what I have told them on occasion, I know I've never gotten a ticket yet that I didn't deserve. <laughs> okay. But you know, I've never been threatened. Um, I've always considered them to be, you know, sort of the the good guys, even though you know they seem to show up at the, the wrong time when I'm driving down the highway. Um, I don't think that that's the case for everyone. And I think that's especially not the case for the native population. Do you have, is, is, it, is it a more common or less common event for someone to be killed by police officers? Yeah, we don't hear about that. Uh, I can't remember hearing about that though, or the last time I heard about that in, in, in Canada. You know, definitely, you know, cases of abuse, definitely abuse of power. Uh, that sort of thing, but as far as uh, uh, you know, people being outright killed. The one thing too that I find very, very different uh, is, you know, I, I think, I hope I don't get into trouble for saying that, <laughs> but uh, I, I think from what I can see from my travels in the U.S. and from what I see from the news and, and everything else, I think the police in the U.S. largely have a shoot first, ask questions later mentality. Okay. We don't see that uh, in Canada. I can't believe some of the situations uh, where I see police in the U.S. with their guns drawn. But that doesn't happen, or I've certainly never experienced uh, that in Canada. Uh, you, yes, they carry You've never had a police officer draw a gun on you? Oh, gosh, no. Have any of your friends? Not that I've ever been aware of. Not that I've ever even heard of, to be honest. They, they all have. They all carry pistols, right? But yeah, I've never, I've never had one pulled. And you know, in my younger days, uh, you know, I was probably not the, the most polite during a, a traffic <laughs> stop. So. And, and do you have mass shootings in Canada? We've had some. Uh, yeah, again, certainly not to uh, not to the degree. Uh, that there is in the U.S., uh, you know, a mass shooting in Canada is a big, big deal because we just don't have it. Uh, you know, I can't believe how numb, uh, you know, uh, as an outsider looking in, I can't believe how numb I've become to mass shootings in the U.S. Yeah, well, wow. okay, it's Tuesday. Of course, there's a, there's a mass shooting. <laughs> and then you find out, you know, a month or two later uh, that there was one, you know, wherever uh didn't even make the news well good heavens <laughs> in canada you wouldn't get that off the news so, have you had any school shootings where people shoot up you know, no, again not that i can uh, not that i can think of um it's just it just okay. doesn't it just doesn't seem to happen but again you know we have uh you know uh, I think our, our laws are, 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 I know our laws are a lot more restrictive uh, on firearms than what they are in the U.S. And you know, we can talk about personal responsibility and all that stuff all we want. At the end of the day, I think that has a big effect <laughs> on how much gun crime actually happens. You, know, you look at Europe, um, uh, you know, they don't have, you know, it to the, near the extent that, that the, the U.S. just seems to be, you know, a bit of an anomaly uh, in that in that yeah. entire area. Wild people, Gary. I have to head out. Thank you. This is right. really nice. I enjoy talking with you.
I have really enjoyed talking to you as well. Let's hope we can do it again sometime. Okay. Uh, All okay. right. I, 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 yeah, I hope it um I hope it was informative and I, I really enjoyed exchanging ideas with you. I did too. I it was informative for me. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Brian. Okay. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.